can you believe it, guys? I think we're actually ready to go on time. So I think that's quite unusual for these sessions. So um, I think we'll just, looks like everybody's settled so we don't have to wait for any stragglers to come in. Um, I don't think I need this box. So I'm just, <laughs> um, uh, oh, here we go. There's a few more people. Come on in guys, we haven't started yet. So this is an unusual uh, way for us to be uh, presenting the products and services session. This is the first time that we've tried this panel style session. Um, so I think what we'll do if it's okay with you guys, um, I'm just gonna get started. My name is Carla Skada. Um, that's the English version, the Australian version, which is where I live now is Carla Skada. Um, the American version is Carla Skada. So now none of you are going to forget that. Um, but that's, um, that's the challenge of having too many A's and R's in my name. Um, but um, I have an esteemed panel here with me today who are my colleagues and my friends. And um, you're also colleagues and friends. So welcome everybody um, to the products and services session. So the way that we want to run the session today is that um, everybody's kind of sitting in order of the way that they're going to be presenting. We're going to just present in a flow. We'll have a few interruptions for some Q&A sessions between the presentations. So I would like to suggest um, for you that are in the room or um, the guys that are online specifically, guys that are in the room, if you wouldn't mind waiting until we have a break in the sessions to ask your questions. The microphones are here in the front of the room. Um, so when you come to the microphone, if you could introduce yourselves, just let us know where you're from, that will be great. Um, for those online, there are online moderators watching for your chats to come through. And um, so if you would like to put your chat in line, um, I'll keep an eye on it here as well to make sure that uh, we, we get all your questions. But um, you really have a panel here today that has got an enormous amount of expertise and can cover any questions that you have. So we are really looking for feedback from the community. We're looking for feedback from you to help us to develop our products in a way that it's useful to you and to help us understand how we can serve you better. So this is why we're changing the style of it because we want it to be interactive. So please don't hold back. There is also no such thing as a dumb question. I know you've all heard this before, but um, if you just feel free to ask anything um, that is comes up as a result of the presentations today or anything that you'd like to know about how uh, we deliver our services at APNIC. So um, I'm going to start by introducing the panel and I'm going to start on the furthest, Tom McGowan. Confusion is we have two Toms today. Um, so Tom McGowan heads up the Oceania team um, at APNIC, so in the services department. And um, so he has, this is the first time that he's been at APNIC for a number of, I mean, it's a presenting live at APNIC for a number of years. Um, so be kind. Um, he has been very involved in the historical resource project that's taken up a lot of our energy this year. So he's gonna be talking a little bit about that. Um, and next to him is Vivek, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, particular, particularly in the um, Southeast Asia community. Vivek is the manager of member services and my Linus blanket. Um, so if ever I need anything, he just seems to know about anything to do with the historical context or um, uh, anything to do with the services. Um, so Again, he's the person to throw questions at. Next to him is almost APNIC royalty, George Michelson. I'm seeing him rolling his eyes. He's probably most people's favorite presenter because he's just got such a beautiful style. Um, and, um, and also vast knowledge. If there's anything that I don't know about the history of APNIC, he's the guy to ask. Um, and very broad knowledge. Um, across the board. So George now heads up the information products uh, uh, development. So he is doing some really interesting things um, that we really hope are going to be helpful to you in, and he's going to be talking a little bit more about that later. Next to him is Raf, 
And so George is already pointing to RAF. So um, RAF looks after the Dash uh, product, which I'm very excited about because I think that that is something that is, we've had a lot of feedback that is very useful. So he's going to be telling you a little bit more about that later. Um, and then we have Tom Harrison, who is the king of the registry. So um, Tom Harrison, so really the registry is what we at APNUC are all about, right? So we are there to maintain a very robust, solid registry for you. And he is the gatekeeper. Um, so he heads up the product development of the registry. And um, so not only is he managing the legacy product that we've grown with over the last 25 years, but he's also leading the next gen project. So um, if he looks overburdened, that's probably why. Um, then we have Chihu, who is also APNIC royalty. Gosh. Yes. So Chihu started um, his, he originally was part of the APNIC executive committee. So on the board for 14 years, I think it was. So um, 18. Wow. Okay. And, um, and now has a really broad um, range of responsibilities across the information systems and also training and development. So he's got a very big portfolio that he has to manage and, um, and does it very eloquently. Um, and then last but absolutely not least is my very favorite UX designer, <laughs> Uh, Lily Chi, who Lily, um, I always say that she eats and sleeps watching your fingerprints all over the internet. Um, as you log into my APNIC, she's watching where you go, where you get stuck. Um, <laughs> so that we can find out ways of making your journey smoother. So she's going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, she's also really creative and comes up with these amazing solutions. So, um, but again, your input, very important to us. So um, I think that I've you kind of got a sense of where we are and what we're wanting to do here today. So if I can ask Tom to kick off. Um, oh, sorry. We've also got Andre. Oh, I forgot about Andre, who is online somewhere. Hi, Andre. He's the only one that didn't make it from Brisbane on our panel. <laughs> I just saw this look of shock in Tom's, in Tom's eyes. Um, we managed to get Andre. He messaged me this morning to say, I've got a cold, so I might not sound great. So Andre um, is the product owner of my APNIC. So he really is the one that is all about your user experience. So he's going to be kicking us off today to talk about that, if we can find him. Hi, Carla. So yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Not sure if you can see me, but hopefully you can hear me. We can. We can see you. We can hear you. Right. Um, no so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off today. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about the product roadmap. Lily will be taking over the um, my APNIC stuff. She's there in person, so it's a little bit better if you hear directly from her. So I'm going to kick off with my presentation. One second. I'll just share my screen. Um, there we go. And full screen. Cool. So my name is... Andre Galdeblom. Um, I'm the product manager for membership. And today I just want to talk a little bit about our product roadmap. So it's really just going to be a little intro. Um, today, what's going to happen is you're going to hear from all of our products and services staff and uh, experts, and they'll be talking about, you know, the, the projects we're working on, the services we're delivering and the products we're doing. Um, and then once they finish talking, that's it. You don't hear from us again unless you reach out and talk to us. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can stay informed and uh, how you can even get involved in some of these aspects if you're interested. So how can you stay informed? Um, we have a APNIC product roadmap, and uh, you can reach this by going to the roadmap.apnic.net um, part of our website. When you land here, you'll be able to uh, filter these products by the product name on the left-hand side here. Uh, you'll also be able to filter by the teams. And then what you can do is have a look at the status for each product. Uh, so you can check whether it's been released or whether it's in development uh, or if it's on the backlog. Uh, and that'll help you sort of stay informed about what the current status of all these products are. Now, some of you may want to actually get involved and have a say in what's going on or have an opinion, uh, maybe give us some feedback. So we've put a link at the top here 
to our new Orbit uh, community platform. And um, there's a group on there that we've created called the User Feedback Group, which many of you already be aware of. Uh, and we'd like you to participate if you can, um, visit that group and come and give us some of your feedback. So this is the Orbit platform. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail about it all. It's really just an evolution of our current mailing list um with a sort of a revamped web interface uh, but i'm going to leave that up to sienna she's going to do a boff on the community platform and really introduce it myself and um, ggm will be there as well um and um she'll be doing this at about 5 30 in the grand, grand ballroom two this afternoon so please join us there to find a little bit more about this but for the purposes of the product roadmap and and some feedback what you can do is visit this group called the user feedback group, and you can have a look at any of the conversations that are currently happening there. Now, some of these are gonna be just generic and some of them will be specific about certain products and services that may interest you. And if you see anything there, you're welcome to click on it and participate in the conversation. All this conversation is open, it's transparent, um, and that's the way we like it at APNIC is that in, you know, we, we wanna hear from you and we wanna make sure that the community has their say. Um, as much as as much as possible. Now, if you don't see anything here that is of interest, um, then feel free to start a conversation, uh, and um, hopefully other people start participating in that too. When you do start a conversation, or when you do participate in a conversation, um, we will be watching product managers, staff, everyone will be involved as much as we can. Obviously, we're not constantly keeping an eye on it, but we'll get alerted. And um, what we're looking for is for you to let us know if you if there's certain things that are of more interest to you or something that you don't like or dislike or do like um these are quite important to us because you know we're looking for feedback on our, some of the products some of the services we do and the more interaction the more feedback you give us uh the better signal we get that these things are important to you and and um that 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 helps us uh, participate a little bit more actively um, and that's really it, just quick and easy. I didn't want to do anything more. I'll leave most of it up to Lily about the uh, membership side, um, but I'd encourage you to visit roadmap.apnic.net uh, as well as orbit.apnic.net. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andre. Um, so as Andre said, just to repeat that, we come here to these conferences twice a year. We invite you for feedback. We do get some very valuable feedback, especially in the one-on-one -on -one conversations, but this is a way of continuing those conversations um, as we move forward. So thanks, Andre. I'm very excited about the new transparency that the roadmap is gonna bring and uh, the opportunities for um, getting some interesting feedback from the community um, on the platform. So tell all your friends. Thanks, Andre. You're welcome to stay on and listen in because um, uh, it would be great if you can hang on. That'll be super. Okay, Tom. <laughs> Tom McGowan, sorry. Um, so Tom's going to kick us off. Thanks, Carla. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tom McGowan and I'm a services team lead for the Oceana subregion. So today I'll be providing an update of the historical resource trend project that the services team have been busy working on this year. So this project was discussed at APNIC 53, so I'll be providing a summary for those who did not attend last session and an update of where we are today. Oh, no. too far. Here we go. So today I'll be talking about the background of what historical resources are for those who are not familiar, um, the challenges with managing historical resources, how the EC resolutions are addressing these challenges, the registry services that may be affected if um, historical resources are not managed under an APNIC account, and any policy proposals that may also affect historical resources not under an account. Um, the current progress of this project and where we are today and the motivations behind the EC resolutions. So what are historical resources? Simply, they are IBV4 addresses and ASN numbers delegated to earlier delegated to organizations by earlier registries prior to APNIC. 
These registries included internic and national NICs. For example, in Australia, AU NIC. APNIC have no formal agreements with these historical resource holders. And for this reason, they are not managed under the current APNIC policy framework. So if you do a lookup of the WHOIS database for resources delegated by APNIC, you'll see an organization object and an IRT object associated with those resources. But with historical resources, there are no IRT and organization objects. So there are main, two main challenges with uh, managing historical resources. The first being is that these resources were registered over 20 years ago. So making some of the data inaccurate as organizations may change over time, for example, through a merger and acquisition or name change. The emails and phone numbers may be outdated and there also may be a lack of registration information. For example, the registrations may show the trade name of an organization or even an abbreviation of an organization or even a project initiative that used these resources. So doing a lookup of these records, you might not find any useful information to determine who the custodians are. Another uh, issue was in relation to security. In the past, historical resources were not protected by a maintainer, which left these resources open to be easily updated and prone to be hijacked. So to address these, these were, so because of these challenges, these were addressed through Prop 018, Protecting Historical Records, which was implemented back in December 2004. This is where Historical resources were protected by the APNIC HM maintainer, which is a consistent practice which we use to delegate to our members. What this meant was that historical resource holders could still use the address space. However, if they needed to make any updates, then what they would have to do is contact APNIC, verify that they are the rightful custodian, set up an APNIC account and pay a nominal fee. This gave them access to basic registration services such as MyAppNIC, which is our online portal, and the ability to make updates in the WHOIS database, for example, registering route objects and domain objects. At the time, RPKI was not an available service. So when it was implemented, only full paying APNIC members had access. Based on community feedback, it was of the opinion that RPKI should be promoted. Therefore, everyone should be able to register rollers as it would not be of use protecting half of the routing tables. So if historical resource holders were not able to register route objects, it will not help the cause of RPKI deployment. To address this, the EC implemented a few resolutions. The first being on the 1st of May last year, RPKI access was made available to all historical resource, resources managed under an APNIC member and non-member account. The second resolution was that all historical resource holders must maintain these resources under a member or non-member account by the 1st of January, 2023, in order to continue to receive registry services so what happens after the 1st of January, 2023? There are a few things that will happen with the resources. The first being is that the historical resources will no longer be published in the APNIC quiz database. So when you do a lookup, no results will be found. The second thing that would happen is because we remove the registries from the database, we also need to update the status of these entries in the APNIC stats files. So at the moment, when you do a lookup, you'll see that these historical resources, the status as either allocated or assigned. So from the 1st of January, 2023, if the resources are not managed under an APNIC account, they will be placed in a reserve status. This basically means that these resources are not delegated or are not available for delegation. So at the moment, the, the 
idea is to keep these resources in reserve status for an indefinite period of time, unless the EC implement further resolutions or there is a policy implementation that will address this of how we move forward with these resources. And finally, resources that are the, the status has been updated to reserved. Um, we have policies in place that state that any resources that are not delegated must be placed under the AS0 ROA. This basically is a routing statement using RPKI to say that no one should be routing these resources as they are not delegated to anyone. So what happens when the resources are in reserve status? Well, there is a policy proposal that will be discussed at tomorrow's policy SIG session, which is Prop 147, Historical Resource Management. This proposal looks at historical resources that are marked as reserved, have an additional 12 months to be claimed by the custodians. After that, APNIC will um, add these resources to our available pool to be re-delegated to other organizations. So if you can attend that um, policy session, that's tomorrow. So when we started this project this year, the first thing that we did was to get a list of all of the prefixes that were not managed under an APNIC account and group them into cases. So this basically gave us an idea of how many cases that we needed to follow up. So this is what the stats look like. We have 3,931 prefixes and 3,503 cases. So the, reason, so the reason why the number of cases is lower than the number of prefixes is because some of these custodians may hold more than one prefix. So these prefixes represent roughly over 7 million IP addresses with the majority of them coming from the 85 slash 16s. And if you look down the table, you'll see there's 3,147 slash 24s, or as they used to call them, class C blocks back in the day. So what we did next was we came up with a standardized process in which we could then contact these historical resource custodians. The first thing that we did was try to outreach to the who is contacts associated with the prefix. So as you can imagine, these registrations are quite old. So making some of the um, emails in the who is really outdated. So next thing, if we received a bounce message or we could not find any email contacts, we would then need to do an alternative search either through a company registry search or going to the company's website. And as far as also doing a Google search, trying to find any traces of that organization. If that all failed, then what we would need to do then is check if these prefixes are being announced. If they were being um, routed by um, an AS network, then we will also try to contact that network to, to ask them if they could assist us with finding contacts for these custodians. So from our work that we've done this year, this is what the outcomes look like. So we have 181 not contactable. So this is where we can't find any information whatsoever for these custodians and they are not being routed. So from next year, these prefixes will be removed. Next, we have six, um, we have 2,688 no responses. So don't be alarmed by that number. What it basically means is that we've sent them emails to these custodians and either they have bounced or they haven't responded to us. So if they've bounced, we would also try to also find an alternative contact for that. And from this group, there are roughly over 500 that are routed. So we'll also be contacting the um, ASN networks in regards to that to kind of try to find an additional contact. And finally, we have 69 prefixes no longer needed. So what that basically means is we've received contact from these custodians and they've advised us, hey, we don't need it anymore. 
we'd like to return it back to APNIC to the free pool. So to conclude, based on the feedback and the and and the challenges, um, there are two main motivations for the EC resolutions. The first being is to improve the APNIC QE's data based registration information and also to improve routing security by providing RPKI access to all resource holders. And now to talk about the benefits of RPKI and the deployment status is my colleague Vivek. Okay, thank you, Tom. So before I go into uh, talking about the benefits of RPKI, I should explain what are some of the limitations in the existing registry services that we provide. So at APNIC, we use the WHOIS database to provide most of our registry functions. And the WHOIS is a very old protocol. So it has a number of limitations, like it does not support authentication, it does not handle redirects properly and so on. And we are addressing these limitations using something called RDAP which is the successor of who is, uh, sorry, yeah, Arda. However, not many people are using this as yet. So for now, we just have to keep using um, who is. So the APNIC who is, it serves two functions. It serves as a network management database. So this is the part which contains administrative information like what we have delegated, who we have delegated them to. And it also serves as a routing registry. So certain objects within the WHOIS database contain routing information about these resources, which our members use to generate filters, automate their router configs, and so on. And the APNIC WHOIS is just one of the routing registries out there. Um, all the RIRs operate their own routing registries. Some large ISPs also operate them. And of course, we have RADB, which is very popular with our members. And all of these routing registries combined form the global routing registry. So these are some of the different objects which serve the routing registry functions. And by far, one of the most commonly used object is the route and route six object. So this object contains information about what is the prefix and which AS number you have authorized to announce them. And some upstreams ask our members to create this so they can do LOA checks. So they say, create this object so we can verify you're the holder and you have authorized us to announce it. And others uh, use this to generate filters. So if they see these objects, they will accept these prefixes. If they don't see it, they drop those announcements. So one of the challenges with the route objects is that there are lots of out-of-date route objects that exist out there. So if you search this prefix in RADB, you will see at least three different route objects, all of them registered in different routing registries and all of them saying that a different ASN is authorized to announce it. So this makes it very hard to say which one of these route objects is created by the legitimate holder, right? Some of them could be the past custodians. Some of them could be malicious, you don't know. And this problem did not only exist with RADB. So in the past, RIPE and CC also used to allow their members to create route objects using ASNs that they had got from RIPE but for prefixes which were delegated by other RIRs. And over time, they had a similar problem where some of these objects became out of date and some of them were not properly authorized by the prefix holders. So RIPE had a policy change and they decided to use RPKI to try and clean up some of these outdated route objects. So one of the benefits of RPKI is that only the resource holders, so in our case, the APNIC member, can create these routing statements about their resources. And after that, if they transfer the resource or return it, but they forget to remove these statements, their resource certificate shrinks, which makes these statements invalid, and they're automatically removed from the routing register, uh, from um, RPKI. So this way we don't end up with the same problems of out of date route objects, which exist in the routing registries. And using RPKI members create something called ROA, which is very similar to route objects, but it has one additional field called max length through which you specify what level of deaggregation you have authorized that AS number to do. 
And then once our members publish these ROAS, other networks consume this information and do something called route origin validation. So they compare what they see in BGP against what they see in the ROAS. If they match, they tag it as valid, everything's good. If it does not match, they tag it as invalid, which means there's a problem and they drop those invalid announcements. So APNIC deployed this RPKI service over a decade ago. And while initially the uptake was quite slow, in the last few years, it has started to get some good traction. So only a few years ago, less than 10% of IPv4 prefixes that are routed by APNIC members had a valid drawer. And now this number has gone over 30%. And if you look at this part of the region in Southeast Asia, this number is over 60%. And this is as a result of few economies like Malaysia, uh, Philippines, where over 90% of all prefixes have a valid ROA. So as more of our members are now creating their ROAs, more networks are starting to do route origin validation. In fact, these days, some networks require you to create your ROAs before they provide service to you. For example, if you take your IPs to AWS, they will first say create a row for your prefix with the Amazon AS number in the origin, and only then they will start announcing those prefixes for you. So to conclude, um, if you haven't created your rows as yet, there's a chance that you may soon need to create them. These are the type of support requests we get from our members around row creations. So if you need help with this, get in touch with the help desk team. And if you have already created your ROAS, great, you've taken the first step, but it's important for you to now properly maintain your ROAS. So APNIC has three upstreams, two of them have already started doing route origin validation, and the third one is in the process of doing so. So once all of them start doing this, networks with RPKI invalids won't be able to access APNIC network. So what this means is if you create a ROA, but you accidentally create an incorrect ROA, or if you change your routing and you forget to update your ROAS, you will end up in an RPKI invalid state. And after that, you can't access MyPNIC to fix it, which is a big problem. So lately we have released some new tools and services to help our members maintain this. But before we go into that, we will pause here and see if you have any questions. <laughs> That's actually a question I was gonna ask. So, um, uh, how can members with RBKI invalids fix their ROAS if they can't access APNIC services? Oh, sorry, question but, from me? Yes. So, if, if, so how can members without RBKI access, uh, sorry, without MyPNIC access fix their invalids? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so in the event you have invalids and you can't access APNIC network, well, few options for now, you have to use an alternate network, maybe your mobile, your home network, as long as it has a valid, you should be able to log in and fix it. As a last resort, the authorized contact can just email us, ask us to remove the bad one so they can then log in and create the correct one. But obviously I would not suggest you leaving it to that stage. Um, GGM and the others will explain the different tools we have so you don't end up in that state. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, please come to the microphone. Thank you. Hi, sir. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what happened? Sorry, uh, can you just tell us uh, your name and where you're from? Yes, my Thank name you. is Jorge uh, from Truxco. That's company. I have a question. Uh, what happened when you have some resources on reserve, for example, that you don't use, they are not announced? You re do you recommend to implement the, the ROA or RPK? Hi. Um, George Michelson from APNIC, I could maybe help answer this. So these are resources that are yours. Yeah. But for complex reasons, we don't need to know why. You maybe only want to announce a 16 from a 13 holding or maybe a specific 24 you want to announce, but the rest you're using in private peerings and you don't want other people to be able to make that announcement. Is that the problem? Yeah, uh, well, so uh, that there is a mechanism for that. Yes, uh, as I as I said, for example, uh, as I may know, uh, when the the purpose of RPK is when don't have the hijacking in the IPs. Yeah, 
So if there's a host or ISP that not announced IPs and he doesn't make an RPK, yep. anyone can take the IPs, right? But there's a way out. Yeah. So you as the delegate holding those resources, you can make a special rower that uses AS0. Okay. AS0 has been marked out in BGP to be the AS that means don't root. Okay. So you can use the mechanism where you say, I, here are the things that I want to say unless another rower exists because that's the magic rule. If a rower exists for any other AS than AS0, it's good. But the only person who can make that rower is you. So if you make an AS0 rower for all the bits that you have some concerns about how people are using it, you can exclude them. You can use it as a turn off switch. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, thanks, John. John Sweden with Aaron. I just have a real quick question for Tom. Of the 69 resources that were returned to you, what was the size of those? Were they all 24s? Or, or from from memory, about? they weren't large sizes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they were and, quite small. And you you obviously advised them that they could use the transfer market rather than return them, and they yep. still said return. Okay. Yeah. Anurag Bhatia, Hurricane Electric. Um, I looked at this data around uh, invalids, so mismatch in the routing table versus the versus the routing registries. Uh, just curious if you have a uh, latest data on how much is the how much is this mismatch for Appenix own registry? How many people say something, declare something in Appenix registry, and it does not match the routing table? Do you have that data? For global table, I can tell it was like 20% plus, it was huge. So we probably have the atoms of this data. Uh -huh. And I hate to say it, Anurag, but I think it's probably for Raf and me to work out the right way to provide it to you. Our focus has been providing the service to you as the delegate, but I think this might be something we have to think about adding in Rex, our general statistics portal, to give a summary of data. Terry, you have a comment? Please state your name at the microphone. <laughs> uh, Terry Sweetser, many hats. So we addressed this in the RPKI deployathon the other day. So of the BGP table that's globally um, in place now, there's approximately 900,000 equivalent objects in RADB and other places, but RADB actually has a total of one and a half million objects. So that potentially means that there are 600,000 invalid objects in RADB yeah. and NTT and all the other. Okay. But is that, but Terry, is that a global stat or That's is that global? Anurag? Right, because I think Anurag's got the pointed question. Yes. You guys have responsibility for a quadrant of this space. Shouldn't yeah. you be telling us how much of it is in this space? Yeah, my, my curiosity was whether it's like 1% or 10%, something yeah. so the scale we, of the We problem. kind of know, but we aren't exposing it. And it's a good point. We Very should do question. some work here. Okay. I have something that is in the same space. I was thinking about while Vivek was talking. He made a fumble talking about route objects and quickly said, no, no, RPKI. But the thing is, Job Snyders has released some code in his IRR daemon, which will use RPKI as a gating mechanism. And if a rower says this route object should not exist, you can turn a feature on that it won't return the data when people do queries. Right. It doesn't remove it. There is still a way to see it. But when you do the IRR config function, it will filter all the noise. I really like that service. I think it's good, smart technology. Sure, that service along with the bundle of the uh, ROA check against the route object would, would clean a lot of things up. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Thanks. Nothing online. Anything else in the room before we move on? And GGM is going to talk about Dash, which um, I am. Yes, which is uh, great. I think you can take it away. 
Thanks, George. Hi, everyone. Um, George here from the Information Products. Raf and I are going to do a double act. So I'll talk to the front part, which is just all the waffle. And he's going to talk to the real part, which shows you how things work. Kind of as a segue from what um, Vivek was talking about, we actually separately have received a request from the community from Aftab. Currently, when you make route objects, the thing is that what checks are, are done, the checks are on you as the address holder. You can put any AS in you like, anyone's AS. So I could make a rower for my address space and I could name check Terry's AS into that. Now, it doesn't really mean anything because it's up to Terry to decide if he's going to actually make that announcement, but it's confusing. And some people want to know. So in IRR, when you get a route object like that, we actually send the AS holder an email saying, hey, you got name checked into this object. And Aftab said, but you don't do this for a rower. That's really confusing. So although we know that this is kind of an evolving space because in the ripe NCC historically, the AS holder actually had to give permission. And that policy was, I believe, changed so that they weren't given permission. And then for a while they were informed and possibly in ripe, they're not even informed now. In APNIC, they still are informed, although they don't have to give permission. We're kind of moving away from having this tied to the creation of the object and looking at ways we could provide this as an information service. And to us, it's a good question that Aftab brought forward. And we're thinking about doing a service enhancement to get some, some things happening. So we, we're kind of listening to what the community wants us to do, thinking about ways of doing that. We have some other things under consideration. We think we have to do a better job of integration into the dashboard that people use. And so we're very likely to give some summaries of our own analytics on your resources when you come to do resource management. We've been asked about whether we could show different views of the state of BGP. It's great, isn't it? When we do training in BGP, we say global routing. It's not the same everywhere, though. And so although we favor a Singapore view of routing to give you a sense of routes in this region, we know that some of you really want to know how well it's reflected in other parts of the world. So we're thinking about how to do that. We've been having conversations with other people who provide metrics in routing, CADA, manners, to see if we can integrate their service. And kind of the story here is that we really want to hear from you what you would like us to do. And you heard Andre at the start talking about Orbit. That's the channel we want you to use too. Raf is going to give you more data on that. Anyway, but now for something completely different. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about what is actually new in our Dash service with Raf. So we have a couple of new things. We now have routing information pages. That's a new facility since the last time we showed you Dash. And we're really pleased to have this release of a mechanism called alerts. So instead of passively you coming to look at the state, or instead of being mailed a monthly summary, you can now be told on demand when something happens that you configure. And we're also looking at the APNIC look and feel. Lily's been doing heaps and heaps of work with the web design group in APNIC, making a much more unified view of how things work in APNIC. And we've been trying to adopt that and integrate into that new style. So to give you the context, the product family that Raf and I work on is really three composite services. And I kind of like to call it my stuff, anyone's stuff, and your stuff. So the my stuff part, that's Dash. That's how we tell you about you. Rex, Rex is the everyone service. It's the everything aggregated together all the time to provide you with information at economy and region level. And Netox, well, that's anyone. You just pick something you want to know about and we'll tell you about it. That's based on a collaboration with the RIPE NCC three products, but we just have a common unified sense of what we're trying to do. We want to inform you. We want to help you understand the nature of resource utilization in the global network. But today, I'm here to talk about Dash. Dash is designed to help you understand your resources. 
And initially, it was designed to help AS holders. And that's why it has the A in it. It's the dashboard for AS Health. But we've realized we needed to move beyond AS holders to cover internet number resource holders. It's everyone who has resources in our space. And we have two subclasses of thing that we're looking at. The first one is suspicious traffic. This is the original service we had where we could tell you as an AS holder that your origin AS is emitting traffic which other people are finding problematical. Typically, it's abuse traffic. It's quite distinct from the BCP38 traffic that Terry talked about in a session earlier. That's where you emit traffic that you shouldn't be originating and creating forms of attack. But this is stuff that you legitimately have in your BGP announcement service, but possibly they've been hacked or they're being used as bad actor facilities to originate attacks on other people. And we want to tell you in a safe way that there's bad traffic coming out of your network. But the second service is the one we've been working on this year. That's the routing misalignment service. And that's really what we're here to talk about. Yes, I really have spent five slides telling you what I'm going to tell you. So the motivation here was to talk about improving the quality of routing. We know that you guys are making public declarations of policy in the Internet Routing Registry. We know that you're making cryptographic assertions in RPKI, and we know that we can see what you actually say in BGP. But what if these three things don't completely agree? What would that mean? So it could be a hijack. We had a really great talk earlier today about a significant misannouncement that was happening from the Singapore area that was affecting some other ASs in region across a public holiday, an extended window when no one was there. And it kind of raised the question, oh, my God, am I under attack? Am I under attack? Well, no. It was a misconfiguration. This was not some actor out there deliberately stealing the resource to do something. It was just a side effect of people doing fat fingered mistakes on the keyboard. And the thing is, we can never know which one it is. We've got no way to know if it's a bad actor or if it's just a mistake. And so we're using this neutral language to try and talk about the problem to avoid casting aspersions on exactly what has been going on. So we spoke with a lot of resource holders at meetings and NOGs, and we've discussed this with our training staff and with the feedback that Vivek and the guys are getting. These actually are our primary channel, unless you come and talk to us directly. And I want to stress that the UX work Lily and the group are doing where she engages one on one, and the feedback that help desk and hostmasters get is absolutely critical to us for building our service. It's really important. And the thing we were getting was a message that said, can you help? Don't try and tell us we're bad, but can you help us understand what's going on? So we've looked into a method we can do this. We know what you have because we're the registry. That's our job. And we can collect a BGP view to know what you say. So Tom has responsibility for publication of RPKI, and we can get a feed of that data as the validator to understand what has been cryptographically declared. And we're taking, it's called near real-time mirroring. I should have expanded the acronyms. This, this slide pack is acronym soup, but NRTM is a protocol that the RIPE NCC designed for sharing routing registry data, and we have a feed of that. And we do a three-way compare. And then we can produce a summary to show you the misalignment between the different resources. We want to go beyond showing, though. Showing's great, we love to show you things. I could talk all day about showing, but we want to tell you things. That's what the real use of the service is. We want to tell you when things get out of alignment so that you can decide what you want to do. But the key thing is you don't want to be told this for everything you do. We know that your BGP higher policy is quite complicated and there may be subsets of networks that are really critical for you to be told about. Maybe you have some unstable connections and being told about BGP flaps for those things would be really unhelpful for you. So rather than saying, we'll tell you everything we think is wrong, we've said, you tell us 
what you'd like to be told about. And the second part of the deal here is not all of you want to be told the same way. Some of you like mail, some of you like text messages, some of you like Slack. Fine, let's see if we can do it using what you want to use. Okay, enough from me. So you kind of want to hear, you want to see how this works. I am going to pass over to Raf, who's going to take you through the way we think the system could work for you. Thanks, George. Okay, so this is how the feature looks like. So this is the routing status in Dash. Uh, on the top right, we have the context filters. So if you have access to more than one member account, you can see you can select there, and you can also select to see routes only for your your prefix or for a specific um, network. So next, we have an overview of the, the inconsistencies. Uh, in this case, there's two row mismatch and 80 uh, route object mismatch. And on the bottom, we have a list of all the BGP uh, announcements and the routing states for each one of them. Uh, sometimes you, you have mismatch, like you can, uh, can see there on the bottom. And if you click more info, you see a dialogue like this. So this is uh, for a row mismatch. When, uh, where the length of the BGP is at 24, but the scope of the row, the max length is 23. So you have a problem. And we provide also required, uh, required actions so you can fix the, the issue. Next, we have an example of a route object mismatch. In this case, the origin S uh, being announced in the BGP is different from the origin S in the existing route object. So, Again, we provide uh, required actions for fix the issue. Now, this is the alerts for routing status. So this is the dashboard where you can see uh, the number of uh, firing alerts, and you see the list of all the alerts that you have created. So when you create a, a alerts, the first step is to define filters. So you can define filters by prefix and origin AS. And for each one of these types, you have a different number of options. Uh, next step, you define alert triggers. So alert triggers, we have two main uh, types, row and route object alignments, and the other one is BGP status. So for the alignments, you can select to receive notifications about mismatches or if the row or route object is not published. Uh, for BGP status, you can create in very interesting um, alerts, such as, for example, if you expect that your prefix are uh, announced only by your ASNs, you can create uh, an alert that if there's announcements for your prefix that are not coming from the ASNs delegated to your accounts, you'll be uh, alerted. Right now, we are uh, supporting, as DGM said, three uh, communication channels for the notifications, email, SMS, and Slack. Uh, we receive feedback from the community that we, um, webhooks and WhatsApp, it's also so interesting. So we'll be taking um, these into account for the next um, improvements to the, to the alerts. Other tools uh, similar and that you might be interested as well, BGP Mon, uh was uh, also mentioned in the previous session, quite popular tool. Uh, IRR Explorer, Nerox, and Ripe Stats. Uh, you can query uh, the routing status for any internet uh, number resource. And also BGP Alerter, I think was, was also mentioned in the previous session. It's a self-hosted tool for routing monitoring and also support alerts in different uh, channels. Uh, so we would love to hear from you, uh, what you think of the, this new tool. Uh, Orbit, Andre already mentioned about Orbit, um, and there's a, a buff uh, later today about this, so I won't get into the details about Orbit, but yeah, please let us know what you think and, um, and help us to shape the future of, the, of Dash. That's all from me, I'll pass to Tom. Okay, 
Thanks. Uh, so we've got three things that we've sorry, finished since the last meeting. The first one is NRO RDAP profile compliance. The second is role preservation during transfers. And the third is a Prop 142 transfer lock. And we've also got a few things that are currently in progress. The first one is route management pre-validation, which is about making sure that people don't cause problems with their BGP announcements uh, by way of making changes in route management. The second is ASN delegation identity, which is about distinguishing member ASNs from customer ASNs. And the third is an alternative who is authorization model. And this is about deprecating password authorization in favor of OAuth tokens. So the NRO RDAP profile is a document that was put together jointly by the RIRs, and it adds a set of extra constraints and requirements on top of those from the base RDAP specifications. And the reason for doing this is that those base specifications are quite flexible. Uh, one thing that stands out in particular is that basically all fields in RDAP are optional. So people can query for a contact and they might get uh, one contact with an email address and one without. And this can be a bit surprising, especially if you're coming from something like, uh, like who is. So by defining this profile and implementing in accordance with it, we make things a bit easier for clients and in particular for client software developers uh, and hopefully that makes things easier for them and improves RDAP uh, adoption. So APNIC and Aaron have implemented this uh, and the other RIRs looking at doing it either later this year or early next year. So next is role preservation during transfers. So to work through an example of how this was uh, previously, we have S as the transfer source, R as the transfer recipient, S has a 24 with a ROA, and the corresponding BGP announcement is RPKO valid. Now, in the next step, S actually has to delete that row. And the reason they have to do that is because their certificate will shrink as soon as the transfer happens. That, in turn, means that the BGP announcement becomes RPKO unknown. Now, for most accounts, this won't be a problem because in a conventional origin validation setup, RPKO unknown announcements will be propagated. But we've had a number of members come to us and say, no, my upstream actually requires that the role be present in order to accept the announcement. This is a problem. I can't do a transfer. Uh, so that's what led to this work. So anyway, next step is the transfer happens, R's certificate expands, S's certificate shrinks. And then finally, R creates the ROA and the announcement again becomes valid. So in the new process, the initial state is the same. But now the transfer can actually happen without the rows being deleted. And the reason is that we now leave the resources in the sources certificate for an extra two weeks after the transfer happens. So then R makes the row that matches S's original row. So there are now two rows. Then S deletes the old row. And then two weeks later, S's certificate shrinks and the announcement has remained valid across or rather during the whole transfer period and everybody's happy. Uh, the next completed item is the Prop 142 transfer log. So Prop 142 is a policy proposal that passed uh, at Apricot. The main thing that was looking to do was to unify the text and the transfer policies, <laughs> but a side effect of that is that we had to start publishing more comprehensive uh, transfer data uh, by way of a log. So previously, we were only publishing unused resource transfer or market transfer data. And now we're also publishing the merger and acquisition and historical resource transfer data at the log that's in the URL on this slide. We left the existing transfer report in place, the one that was just about market transfers, uh, mainly for backwards compatibility purposes. We didn't want to break anybody's scripts. So even though those reports are very similar, uh, we still will keep both over time. Okay, work that's currently in progress. Uh, to work through an example of how route management pre-validation will function, the beginning of the process is the same. The user <laughs> clicks to add, uh, or rather to register a route in the system. So this modal appears and they can enter a prefix and an ASN and so on. Uh, but after submitting, instead of 
that being acted upon immediately, it goes into this pending queue of operations and the user can then make further updates and deletes that will also go into that queue. Then after the users made all the changes that they plan to make, they can pull up that queue and review the changes before committing them. And the reason that we have this queue in place now is pre-validation requires uh, something like this to function correctly. And the classic example here is if you have a prefix announced out of two ASNs, but you're only able to add one row at a time, then adding one row will cause the system to warn about the invalidation of the, of the other announcement and vice versa. So that's why we have this here. And then once the user goes to commit the changes, they'll be reviewed against, uh, the B, reviewed, reviewed against what's in BGP. And if anything uh, is going to be affected as far as RPK validity is concerned, that will be displayed to the user. They can then go back and fix things up. Or if they know that it's actually going to be okay, then they can go ahead with the changes anyway. Next, we have ASN delegation identity. So the way this works today is that a member can get ORTNUMs for the, get ASNs rather for themselves, obviously, but they can also apply for them on behalf of their customers if their customers don't want to become uh, APNIC members. But we don't collect very much data about the customers, uh, typically just a couple of descriptive strings. Um, so actually finding out who's operating an ASN for a third party can be difficult and distinguishing a member ASN from a customer ASN is difficult as well. So unsurprisingly, we'll be collecting more detail about customers, uh, but the key thing here is that we'll be adopting the schema that RIPE use uh, for, this, for this use case. So having a customer org object that the ORTNUM is linked to, and then also having the member org object against the sponsoring org uh, attribute. And this will help uh, people just be able to distinguish this better, as well as getting uh, more direct information about who's actually operating the ASN. And finally, we have the alternative who is authorization model. The vast majority of maintainers and IRTs in who is today are using password-based authorization. This is problematic for a few reasons. Uh, one is that the way in which who is is set up uh, increases the risk of inadvertent disclosure of hashes as opposed to how uh, maybe more conventional systems are set up. You occasionally have to rehash due to changing security requirements, which can be annoying for users. And also, who is does support PGP as an authorization mechanism, but it's notoriously difficult to set up and people just, you just end up having a lot of trouble with it if they do try it out. So we're going to deprecate passwords in favor of OAuth tokens that addresses each of the above problems. OAuth tokens are a little bit trickier to use than passwords, but there's a lot of prior art in this space. So we're not expecting people to have any major issues. And the other thing is that this will be transparent for the most part uh, for most users. The only users will, who will have uh, substantial work to do perhaps are those who are doing email updates. And that's all, thank you. So any questions uh, based on that? Lots and lots of information. I do love the product. I do love Dash. I think we've had some, as I said, some very good community feedback. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Anurag Bhatia. Um, I don't have questions. Can I use this platform to make two feature requests in this new platform? Yes, yes. Okay, so going to your first slide, GGM, uh, you, the one with Aftab, you said uh, you want to give alerts uh, if someone puts in puts my ASN on their, on their route object? Yes, to match the behavior in routing where if they make a route object, we send an alert to the ASN holder as a matter of current behavior. That's that's good to have, but uh, how about flipping it around? What I'm more interested in would be, is anyone registering a route object in any registry with my prefixes, my APNIC prefixes? So if we detect any use of your resources, be they ASN or addresses in any of the route surface that we can see, given that we know you and we know you have ownership of those re responsibility for yes. those resources, yes. inform you. Yes, uh, I'm mentioning of registry, not the route yeah. table here. I, 
I think we could talk offline about expanding that function. We had a narrow implementation goal, which is match behavior across a service we have in us to do another thing in a service in us. But you're making a valid point. I want to stress, we're probably moving away from always telling people thing happened. We're moving to one that says most people don't seem to want to know. We're getting complaints about being spammed. But if you want to know, here's a way that we'll do the service. That, that makes sense. Uh, keep yep. in mind, uh, if someone creates a route object with MySN, the only attack vector as far as I can see is uh, they would end up in bombarding my peers because they would have a larger filter to create. Yeah. So if you today go and register 100 prefixes in my yeah. SN, I, There is an attack yeah. profile and we think a volume quality might be necessary here. Yes. But I must stress in but the, the other way of my dangerous. UX expert, I cannot commit to this until it has been validated. Right, right. right. The other uh, second feature request I wanted to make is <laughs> you mentioned you will give an Sorry, alert. Could you, could you give your name, please? <laughs> this is a continued question. Why are you asking for name again? <laughs> so uh, the second request is um, give an alert when you see adjacency changes. I think you're focusing too much on origin ASN. If playing with the devil's advocate side, if I want to hijack someone, more easier is I'll just pick their ASN and their prefix and then just will yeah. put in my downstream. So do a do a more specific and attack on the path. Yes. I haven't got a solution for it. You can look for the routing register. You can look for the. So you would you would like us to look for deltas in BGP? Yes. And say wow, there's been a path change. This is weird. What's going on? Yes. But the surface of validity for the more specific may be very specific. So I'd have to be looking in a lot of That's routing spaces. Sure. I think I'm going to ask my comrades in Ripe to do this. They're well equipped to do this. They have lots of. No, I <laughs> I I hear what you're saying, and we'll take that on board. But again. I must talk with my UX expert to validate if this is an appropriate model. Right, thanks. Hello. So, hello. Please Dave state from your APNIC. name. How are you doing? Um, you talked about, obviously, I'm extending upon Anurag's question, which is, if we're doing it for out objects, do we do it for AS sets? Because the potential impact of somebody putting somebody else's AS in an AS set when building prefix filters, et cetera, becomes extending on other problems. So should we be notifying? Yeah, it's a, it's a valid question. And I think we're going to have to put it into the improvement bucket. I, I think it's something we have to think about. We'll measure uptake of what we've done as a ground state. And then based on that and acceptance in the community, we'll probably validate the idea. But I, good input. Thank you. Chehu, please, I'm sorry for holding you up. <laughs> no so problem. Just before we move on, um, any other questions? We're just going to, I think that uh, Chehu's what probably everybody's favorite service in APNIC is uh, training. So he's just going to give us a quick update on what's going on there um, and how that actually links into um, people understanding the importance of RBKI. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Carla. Um, my name is Chiu Cheng. I'm in charge of the infrastructure and development uh, area in APNIC. Uh, this time, I won't go through the parts for infrastructure and operations. I'll only uh, you know, cover a bit about the latest development in the area of uh, training and development. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, now we use uh, branding of APNIC Academy to cover uh, all of our training and technical assistance activities. On the self-paced training part, uh, you know, I mentioned last time, but now we have more users for the OSPF self-paced learning course. And uh, we have published quite a lot of new virtual labs on the platform. Um, so I hope, you know, more people can be benefited. And uh, our product team, Academy product team is, uh, you know, busy working on the uh, training wiki migration to the Academy platform. I'll have more slides to cover that later. And these uh, and there are some stacks for the self-paced learning. I won't go through them. Uh, and uh, for instructor training, uh, you know, uh, we do in-person training, online training, hybrid training, uh, depending on the situation. And our training is all open, meaning it will open not to not just members, but also non-members. 
uh, for our online training uh, in Switzerland uh, will be free, but uh, we will charge nominal fee uh, for in-person hybrid training because we need to you know, pay for the venue, catering, etc. Uh, but members will receive discount. And uh, you know, all the registration can be done on our academy platform. That's you know, uh, you know, uh, one of the important uh, uh, integration for all of our uh, training and technical assistance activities. And uh, you know, for the stacks, uh, you know, uh, by July thirty uh, first, uh, we have already done ninety trainings and uh, like twelve webinars. And uh, I think we can be able to meet the target for this year. And uh, more about uh, like in-person training. Uh, since last meeting, uh, we have done uh, quite a number of uh, in-person training. We really travel there. And uh, so, you know, of course, like uh, it's not uh, something very simple as you understand. And like, you know, uh, uh, at one time, like one trainer uh, received COVID before <laughs> starting the training, we needed to like uh, do some like backup arrangement. And, and, and also, uh, you know, after like uh, the travel, maybe, uh, you know, one trainer got COVID. Um, so it happened. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't stop us from doing this. Uh, and so we'll uh, continue to uh, arrange in-person training. In fact, in the coming months, uh, we are planning to go to at least Mongolia, Timor Leste, and, and Maldives. Um, so we hope we can see uh, some of you there. And another important development would be the community trainers. Uh, we do want to scale up our training and technical assistance activities. Uh, now we have funding from Foundation. Thanks for Foundation. Uh, we, we are able to do more training. Uh, but we can not just rely on our staff. Uh, we have uh, we we'll, we'll actually rely more and more on uh, the, our community trainers. And now we have five retained community trainers, uh, twenty nine voluntary community trainers from you know, the, the 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 economies that are uh, listed here. And specifically for retained community trainers, this is a new model. Uh, we have like uh, recruited. Uh, retain community trainers in Fiji, Cambodia, Mongolia, Nepal, Philippines, some of them are here and uh, I won't go through the list. Uh, you know, the main difference is uh, all of them will work for us 10 days per month, meaning that they are like working with us half time, uh, part time sorry, half time, I should say. And uh, the, the, the goal is to do at least one training per month in the relevant economies. And uh, we are going to recruit, um, uh, retain community trainers in the uh, economies that are listed here. And if you're interested in becoming a community trainer, uh, please go to the website, or if you want more information, please talk to any of our staff trainer or, or myself. And we are also hiring full-time staff. Uh, we have two vacancies for technical trainers, uh, full-time trainers and one vacancy for the uh, training curriculum developer uh, targeting uh, more on the certification part. And for the product team, we have two vacancies for full stack developers. And if you have like anti -re referral, please ask them to go to the website. And uh, we have like uh, four new recruits, uh, you know, uh, starting this year. Uh, Atwa join us uh, in January as a full-time trainer. He join us as a coordination manager, helping with doing the coordination. And uh, Nasser join us from Bangladesh um, as the learning content developer, you know, focusing on like uh, doing more content development. And we are glad to announce we'll have Terry Switzer to join us as training delivery manager for South Asia and Oceania starting October 4th. Uh, welcome. And uh, of course, we have a full team of uh, the leaders like Atli, Jamie, Peter, Shang, Terry, T, and myself together with other team members. We'll work very closely together to uh, have like uh, better integrated, better aligned uh, training and development activities. Okay, specifically for uh, our PKI, <laughs> Uh, 
uh, our focus is, uh, of course, uh, for the training would be, and technical assistance would be, uh, to help the community uh, members to clean up the embedded rowers. Uh, we shouldn't just create rowers for uh, you know, creation sake. Uh, we must make sure that we are creating valid rowers and maintain them continuously. And we also have targets to like achieve and maintain high rower adoption with valid rowers uh, per economy. And uh, for the ROV part, uh, we are of course doing training or deploy a thorn uh, focusing, uh, like setting that up at effective locations, meaning like transit providers, uh, IXV route servers, and also maybe like uh, networks which uh, do a lot of peering. And, um, and with the retained CT, we are able to do more RPKI uh, tutorials targeting the local community. Uh, we have done uh, five in uh, Philippines, Cambodia, and Mongolia. And we will, you know, continue to do that. Another thing I want to highlight is the Edge ROM surface. Uh, now on this uh, conference network, we have Edge ROM enabled, and we also have uh, changed the uh, eligibility a little bit. Um, and uh, so, for all the APNIC Academy users over 18 years old. Uh, we, when they have completed one online CFA course uh, and also completed the successful quizzes, then they are eligible to register for the Edge ROM service. Uh, and then they can like have Edge ROM access in like university campus, libraries, uh, hospitals, or even airports. Uh, now, now we are go back, going back to travel. This kind of service would be uh, you know, more convenient for people when they travel overseas. Uh, like I, I just discovered that you know, Edge ROM service in fact is available in Brisbane Airport. If you come to Brisbane and you have Edge ROM access, then you have like uh, Wi-Fi connectivity uh, right when you arrive at uh, Brisbane Airport. And of course, we want to you know expand this uh, to like instructor lab course as well. But of course, we need to system ready uh, before we can have that. And uh, also, a bit more about the training wiki. Uh, as I mentioned, we want to move everything under one platform. Um, so this uh, separate system will be moved into the same platform as well, making things easier for our own staff, our own community trainers, as well as uh, the training uh, participants. And uh, we, of course, will host you know, the materials on the relevant website, the, 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 the training website. And uh, we are using uh, Confluence to help do the job so that it will be easy for our trainers. And uh, now we already have listed uh, all the past, I shouldn't say all, you know, uh, the, the past uh, trainings that we uh, have done starting like 2016. And uh, you have some basic information on the Academy website already, but later when uh, the project has completed, uh, then even the materials and other related uh, relevant uh, you know, information will be there as well. And of course, we'll uh, also do some uh, training uh, guides uh, on the Academy platform to help people to uh, you know, get to know how to use it. And, uh, you know, uh, I want you also to refer to my previous uh, presentation about the, the training and the development side. Uh, please also read it so that you can have a full uh, idea of what we are doing. That's all. I Thanks, Chihu. Pass. I actually learned stuff. Um, wow, <laughs> it's just there's, there's been a lot going on there. So that's that's great. Um, if there's no questions on that, then I'm going to move on to Lily, who's going to wrap up. Um, and uh, going back to what Andre introduced the the topic earlier about the roadmap and how we're moving forward. Um, unbelievably, we're actually. I thought we'd have plenty of time, but um, yeah, are you going to come up here? Yeah, um, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm going to stand up and I'd like to invite everyone else to also stand up and take a stretch if you feel like it, because I'm feeling a little sleepy by this point of the presentations. <laughs> yeah, and uh, feel free to sit down whenever you're ready.
So today I'm going to talk to you about the MyPinic dashboard and some of the new changes that are coming your way, as well as uh, contact management improvements. So some of you may have already come by uh, the desk and have seen me do some of this research with people having one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, but I'd like to just invite you again, if you haven't already, come and have a chat with me. I'd love to see you. So what my APNIC looks like today um, is this. We've got resource manager on one hand and my APNIC on the other hand, and they're connected with a giant green button. And the only reason why it's green is because we're so scared that no one's going to notice it and you won't know where to go to find resource manager. But really this is um, stemmed from a technical um, hurdle that we had to deal with. And then we did some user research to validate this concern. Um, is it really something that people are struggling with? Um, we did some tree testing, some information architecture analysis, and also some prototype tests with gamified missions based on common tasks, like how do you find your billing in my PNIC, or how would you um, edit your who is at that up? And we found some interesting things throughout um, these experiments and the details were actually in the last conference talk that I gave. So some of the current pain points that we have um, is number one, lack of reliable navigation. Some of the menu labels are not really intuitive uh, and it's not really consistent between page to page. And of course, the look and feel could always be improved. Um, we've always heard people say, ah, your interface looks a bit like it was stuck in the 90s. I know um, it's one of those things that we're trying to improve. But the most important part is actually the low discoverability of tasks and features. People often could not find what they're looking for, and that's why they would ring help desk. And this is what my, my PNIC will look like soon. So my PNIC will become your one-stop shop for managing everything integrated with resource manager. Um, in the contextual menu, you'll see your member account settings um, as well as tools and resource manager all in one navigation bar. So you no longer have to look for that connection between my, my, my yeah, sorry, my PNIC portal and resource manager. We've also implemented widgets for quicker access to major features, um, particularly around resource management and billing. We've also uh, improved the clarity of the structure so that you don't have to guess where you're going. And what I mean by that um, is through these videos, you can see in the current version, you have to go to resource manager, go to the resources page, and then go to who is updates. However, in the new version, you can go one click from my portal to who is updates all in one consistent navigation. You can go back and forth very easily and you can go from who is updates directly to another feature just by going through the contextual navigation bar. A very important part of our tree testing and our prototype testing revealed that people want to know what they're getting themselves into. So this preview feature of actually having a hover state on the menu just to show you what are all of the child pages inside the parent category um, proved to be very helpful for people and they had much less uh, task failure rates just based on this one improvement alone. Um, and so we've decided to implement it and our developers are working on this right now. And uh, you can expect to see this just before the end of this year. So that would be our phase one of, um, or I guess the MVP of my PNIC dashboard. Uh, in the next phase, we're trying to come up with better widgets and as well as customizability for these widgets. So the option to turn them on and off, depending on your personal preference. So for example, if you are someone that uses billing a lot, you can keep billing. And if you're not interested in RPKI invalids or community or even who is updates, you can turn those widgets off um, so that your dashboard stays tailored to you and it's maximized for your productivity. Next, um, I'll talk about contact management. So about contact management, there's three main points. The first one is who you are. Second one is what you can do based on who you are. And the third thing is the points of notification. 
We're considering moving to a data model where authorized contacts must use an APNIC login to authenticate because currently some of our contacts are just that, contacts. They're a point of contact with an email address and a phone number. However, they don't actually have authenticated login access to my APNIC. So we're doing some user research on various models that we're considering on this. Um, and we have some cool diagrams and questions to show you. So if you are a technical contact or a corporate contact, we would love to hear your thoughts on some of these questions that we have. Um, and we're doing user research on the subject right now between today and tomorrow. Uh, we've already done some yesterday. So thank you again to all those who came. And uh, we have some gifts like uh, water bottles and t-shirts and battery packs and whatnot. So um, please come by. The desk is literally just outside this room. Um, yeah. If you have any additional feedback for us, um, like we mentioned before, Orbit is our new community platform. Uh, it's integrated with the mailing list. So you can either access it from your email client or you can go onto the web interface. Um, it'll be one and the same. So please feel free to share your ideas on there. Um, I'll be on there all the time, just checking your comments and what you've said, and maybe following up with some of you if you have some really cool feature suggestions. Um, and of course, come and join us at the community platform buff. And that's everything I have for you today. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. Thanks, everyone. Uh, any more questions before we literally have five minutes left? How cool is that? Yeah. Oh, four minutes. <laughs> anyone going going uh, so i just really want to thank everybody here today i think it's been um i appreciate the input and um the ideas and uh and i hope that you guys have enjoyed going on this journey with us that we take you on every 18 months i mean every six months um and uh, also wanted to thank the technical team the guys in the background who are running around making the tvs work and the microphones and everything else we gave them a little bit of a task to uh, to do today um but um appreciate you joining us and um do Come and speak to anybody. So most of the, the Lily will be at the services desk outside. Tom's there most of the time. Vivek and I are backwards and forwards. Find us, ask questions um, if you need anything, or there is a host of ways for you to contact us online, especially with the new community platform. So please feel free to reach out at any stage. So thank you, everybody, and thank you to the panel. Oh, wait, before you go, we're going to do a selfie. Just got an instruction from India. Oh, I got you all now. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.